as uh, Eugene mentioned, my name is Igor and this is Boris. Both of us are actually employed at Tinder currently. Uh, I am an engineering manager responsible for release management uh, for the entire Tinder uh, stack, including the mobile uh, iOS and Android applications. Previously, I lived in Silicon Valley in Bay Area, worked in companies such as Barnes & Noble and Expedia for more than a decade. Uh, my background, I started as a regular QA manual test or whatever I used to call quality assurance engineer and uh, in 2011 I shifted to test automation. I worked in the web, mobile through entire career, majority mobile experience and uh, transitioned to management uh, back in uh, 2012. Um, since mobile became my expertise, I actually started teaching in that area in 2013 and formed a company called Code Fitness. Uh, we actually teach uh, uh, boot camps on the uh, test automation. Um, majority of them actually in Silicon Valley because the audience for that was uh, bigger back then. Now the uh, high tech growing in here in Los Angeles and Orange County, and which is great. I enjoy the trend and I think it's gonna it's still going up. And uh, Boris, Boris actually an uh, IES engineer. He is the USC graduate, a master's degree in computer science. Um, and he is currently working uh, at Tinder on identity team. So pretty much the whole authentication process on this guy for the IES product. Um, today we're actually going to do a little bit different than you guys have seen before on the meetups. We uh, try to do actually more hands-on kind of presentations to show you what things are in reality rather than gives you like a lot of you know slides and speeches so our slide deck is very short and you're going to see more code so this is more i would say technical meetup let's get started let's go so before we jump to the first topic and we actually shuffled if you've seen the uh agenda for today we shuffle topics a little bit because they depend on each other and complement each other so we're actually going to present with the uh, mocking network services or network layer on IS applications uh, as a first topic and analytics we're going to do after uh, Q&A session. So, um, but before we're going to jump to the first topic, uh, I would like to ask you guys a question because this is interactive meetup, right? I would like to understand who you are, what the audience. Please raise your hand if you're currently a mobile tester, testing mobile applications, manually, automated way. Okay. And who is doing the web? Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> Out of group people who are actually doing web, how many people do mobile web as the majority of their work? Okay. So if you noticed, uh, for the past few years, the transformation goes towards the mobile nowadays, right? Look at yourself. Every day, everything that we do, we use the phone, right? Booking hotel, right? Scheduling uh, any appointments, even for haircuts, everything. Purchasing goods, Amazon, eBay, pretty much your whole life on a mobile device. Therefore, they say that in a few years moving on forward, the entire high tech gonna transit more towards mobile. Web is not gonna go anywhere. Don't freak out people, because a lot of people sitting here in the web. It's gonna go towards mobile web, right? The most responsive, or right now emerging platforms for uh, of, uh, such as uh, React Native, right? You can build cross-platform applications, which is very similar to mobile. Uh, so the uh, uh, the web is not gonna go anywhere. It's just gonna transform. So what we're gonna show you today, it's gonna be all IES native solutions. This is built for iPhone or any like uh, iPad. Apple TV, or even the uh, OS X for the Max, but we're gonna give you examples today specifically for iPhone, because the iPhone market is very large, it's very big, right? So a lot of people using iPhones nowadays. Is it Boris 50-50 right now with Android market not share? Like in US probably, yes. Yeah, in US probably 50-50. Probably, probably not, but we're going towards that. Yeah, we're going towards that, so. Before, uh, only rich people could afford iPhones, right? <laughs> <laughs> nowadays, it's actually equalizing slowly. So uh, today we're going to talk, talk about uh, topics which is very sensitive in test automation world. And why I say sensitive? Because not, this is not my words. This is the coming from the industry. What we're going to show that this is not the solution we baked in the Tinder. 
This is the solutions that actually used across large organizations such as Google, LinkedIn. There's amazing articles and blogs written about this. We're going to show you the best practices around those topics and why explain why they're important nowadays, especially if you're thinking to transition to test automation world. Everything I'm going to show today is not only for the mobile. For all the folks who sit here from the web world, you, it's applicable there as well. And it's important. So all the aspects you can actually inherit into your web world if necessary. Let's get started. Have you ever heard about mocks and stops? Doesn't yes. matter uh, web people and mobile people. Anyway. Raise your hand if you heard stops. about mocks and stops, fakes. There's so many. Good. Oh, that's awesome. Great. So let's talk about this. So let me try to explain in a simple language using my hand gestures what it's all about, right? There's, I'm, sh I'm assuming there's a lot of people who never heard about mock stops or never worked with a, a web services before. Um, so we're gonna basically try to explain in plain English. So think about this. When you're using any application, right? Let's say Facebook. You go talk to your friends on a Facebook chat or you call Messenger, right? or you are uh, putting a post on Facebook, your application talking to the back end, right? Use a Facebook Graph API, a very famous one. So obviously what happens is that when we do that as a tester, right, we're hitting the entire st stack, the whole layers, right? All the way from the clicking or tapping on the button down to the databases on the Facebook servers, right? The problem with this approach that we, uh, we're gonna talk about automation, is obviously, uh, we're gonna describe that in details, is uh, we don't know what happens in the whole stack, right? If something goes wrong, and that's what we are testing, we try to discover defects, bugs. It's very hard to understand which layer the failure is, right? If we see the bug, we're like, okay, we file the bug, go figure it out, right? However, in automation world, right, think about this. When we hit the whole stack, we run to a lot of different issues, which we're actually gonna describe this presentation. I'm gonna show you why in test automations is important to cut off from the back end. Think about this, when you call yourself a client tester or functional tester, you try to mimic user behaviors of the application, right? You try to isolate the application in a hermetic environment, right? So therefore, you're not a back end tester. You don't test the back end services. You're definitely not testing like some third party dependencies, like for instance, if your application uses Facebook, Google again, definitely not. So what you try to do, you try to eliminate a lot of unnecessary things that you do need to even touch or think about. You are testing a functionality of a mobile application in a hermetic world, right, in itself. So therefore, you're eliminating a lot of issues that can uh, be pertained with that, such as A-B test, right? For instance, we're gonna talk about, think about this. There's right now at least 10 versions of the same screen, right? But there's a 10 versions on the back end as well. And you don't know, it's randomly thrown, like a 10%, 20%, uh, depends on how the server configured. You have no control over this. You have no control on the user data. You don't know the server gonna respond to you. You definitely have no control on the server errors. Right? If you need to test how the client will behave in negative scenarios, all of you testers here, I'm assuming, you do a lot of negative testing. How will you make the client to fail something, right? You're gonna say, backend, please throw me like 500. It's not gonna happen. But you need to simulate this to see how the uh, client gradually will fail with a proper error. Think about all these things. Any right? other issues you can think about? Yeah, what other issues when do when you do like live when test application gets live services, what other issues you can run into? Anybody can think about it on your day-to-day -day testing? Raise your hand. We can help you out. Any issues? Any issues with live testing? Network uh, latency. Absolutely. Very important one. We cannot control the server response based on the load. You are the tester testing in production. There's millions of users testing exactly your application at the same time. If you're testing at midnight, Hopefully, the traffic will be lower, unless the application is global, right? We don't know. So it's very hard to understand how the application behavior. With network stopping, we completely eliminate latency. Zero. Because we don't hit the live backend, right? You, we basically, it's called hermetic testing. You're going to hear that word a lot in different presentation, and that's what it does. It actually removes latency. Anything else? Uh, don't get us wrong. 
backend testing is extremely important as well. We just say that it should be completely independent, completely isolated, right? Like somebody else could test backend completely isolated, or even you can test it with different technologies, with different CI probably, right? With different programming language, it doesn't really matter. So both things are important, but here right now we talk about client testing. So we don't care about if, if there are some errors in the backend. Exactly, that's why, you, uh, remember Michael Cohn's the uh, test pyramid? Remember that? This famous one. If you're a tester, you probably like, should know like a Bible right, or something. So there is different layers, but usually Michael Cohen shows three layers. It shows the tip of pyramid, which is UI functional test, integration test in the middle, and unit test. Uh, but this is 2012, right? This is like, <laughs> I'm sorry, Michael Cohen pyramid a little bit outdated. If you've seen the modern pyramids, they have much more layers, like you said, database, right? Could be like very bottom of it. Unit test, integration test is crazy. When you say the word integration test, people get like a goose skin, like what it means? It could mean anything. Some people think about integration test as the REST API test. But some people think about integration test as some sort of microservices layer test, how the different microservices talk to each other. Boris think about integration tests is how different modules on IS are working together. But many people think it's a unit test. So there's a lot of confusion what the actual testing means nowadays, right? It's, it's crazy. So that pyramid has different layers. What Boris tried to say that we are talking about client. Think about the tip of pyramid of Michael Kahn. We're talking about functionality minus everything else. And as Boris mentioned, I'm gonna repeat his words, it doesn't mean we don't have to test them, we must test them, but in isolation. So we know exactly what's failing and we can respond to this quickly and help developers to fix right issues right away instead of spend hours to debugging like, I don't know what's going on. Either the REST API layer failed, either the database wasn't properly populated, microservices went offline or was under new deployment. We have no clue. The stack, the stack could be endless. That's why we have testers, us, testing different layers. There are people who are testing the UI layer. There are people who are testing the uh, you know, intermediate layer, like REST API layer. There are people who are testing microservices for entire career. And there are people who are testing only databases, and which is fine, right? And that gives us opportunity to have jobs, and the jobs become more smarter. And this is good, right? So today, today, we're going to focus on automation and testing that functional layer of the application and isolation. But counterintuitively, doesn't it increase a lot of cost of software development? I'm sorry? I'm not saying this, this is wrong or right, but if, if you can afford to have a team of testers in each layer, it, it's a dream work. I, I agree. Most organization, they don't have time for it, they don't have cost for it. Absolutely. They need software out of that, you know, to the market now. God bless you. you uh, this is this is what the person said. What's your name? Ravine. Ravine. What says is absolutely true. There are startups. For the matter of fact, I met the person who was a uh, original developer of Selenium APIs for Ruby. The person who actually developed the whole Selenium APIs for Ruby, original guy, and he is right now CTO in the company. And I asked him, Mike, are you using what you've re been reading for many years? He says, No. I was like, why? I don't have time for this. We have to deliver fast. We don't have time for testing. I work in a startup. Things change so rapidly. I have no, testing for no time for testing at all. The guy who actually invented this doesn't use his stuff. I never worked for a startup, almost. But any company is like that. Whatever company I work True. for, it's, True. it's the same. True. However, it changes. It changes, and uh, it all depends on the company and vision. It also depends on the management. If the manager, and he is nodding the head, you guys don't see because I see all of you. If the management believe in quality, right, and it changes. I've seen a lot of companies before who are completely reluctant about quality. They said, I don't care about quality, we need to move fast. But then they hit at that end, right? The user reviews get worse, customers not happy, technical debt, bloating, application sucks. That's the reality, right? So what happened in Tinder, thanks God, right? I went through three layers of management, three different like, you know, CTOs and, and uh, CEOs until we actually get to this. It takes time, right? And it also depends on us.
to teach our leadership teams to tell them what they need to do and what they're not, right? It's also on us. We're not supposed to sit silently and hoping they're gonna come to us and ask to do this. We have to educate them. We have to educate our leadership teams and tell them what's good or bad and why. And there's always ROI and you have to explain how many people we need and you have to come to this wisely. Again, today we're gonna focus on IES and we're gonna show you things that work very well and we're gonna show you only two topics. There's more than two topics, right? We're, we're gonna live for more meetups later, right? So we can meet all of you again. So again, let's come back to the topic of network layer uh, mocking. Let's go to recap uh, all the issues we, we talked here. Yes. So first, test setup. Think right. about test setup. Let's go talk about this. If you need your automated test, right, to, to actually mimic some use case scenario, how do you mimic with that with live services, right? Very hard, right? If I want certain outcome, if I want my test always to be talking to Boris at Tinder, how can I do this, right? It's impossible. I'm gonna go through live data, gonna get random people, maybe I'm gonna get some sort of, you know, some A-B test popping up in the middle of this. How I'm gonna orchestrate, that's the proper word, my test to actually give me what I want to see. Again, we are testing the client side. I don't care what the backend returns. I want to see how the client gonna render things on the front end, right? So test setup, test orchestration is a very important aspect of the network studying because we can tell our fakes what to give us back. My test always gonna return the same data all the time. So my expected result will be always the same and we eliminate what's the most important thing? Flakiness, right, because it's always has to be the same data. Next one? Right, so again, number one, we want to control our data and we want to be able to set up our data for our test. So continuous backend deployments. How many uh, people, if you know, raise your hand, how many people know how many deployments actually done per day in your company on the backend? Anybody knows in this room? Good, how many, like, where are the many of them? Three to four deployments per day. Seamless. You have no idea they won't happen. They just forget to tell you. That can ruin your test. If you have automated tests written against live services, somebody deploys something new on the back end, you're done. It's not, basically, you basically don't know what's happening, right? The whole data change, the, you, you name it. Schema of your JSON can change. Blow up everything if you want to depend on it. I don't know, I'm just giving you an example. We don't know. So that's, that's the problem because data nowadays uh, and the backend even services and uh, logic changes few times a day. When I started career, it was few times a quarter. <laughs> so we have to respond to this. So now we are completely eliminating this because again, our data is preset, it's fake, right? We just said, tell our test what kind of data should return all the time. Okay. Next one, network latency. The biggest issue, right, nowadays tests have to be very fast in order to qualify for CI system. You probably heard a lot of times, you want to automate a test, it's running 15 minutes. It's like, you kidding me? My one test runs for three minutes. Whatever, like five tests? Yes, and that's the number one. Uh, there is an amazing article written in 2016 by a LinkedIn company called 3 by 3 3x3, read it, amazing article. It talks about speed, called speed of light, right? Or need for speed, I think. So the reality of the test, tests not only have to be stable, have to be fast. How you expect functional tests to be fast, right? And that's why we are talking about stubbing, because stubbing remove latency completely. We don't have to wait like, you know, 500 milliseconds for network response anymore, or 1,000, or sometimes 3,000, right? Depends on how the load on the server. We completely eliminate that part. And we can have one separate test, the test how your app behaves if there is a latency, right? If there is some error uh, as a result of some latency. We can check it separately with one test. We don't need to experiment on our, like, hundreds tests. Yep. <coughs> Talk about that, right? This is the probably uh, very important for negative test cases. How would you simulate the, for application, the, uh, we're talking about is the backend errors, right? There's a lot of them, right? There's four, three, there's custom backend errors. Very hard. I mean, you have to you have to like go out of your skin and somehow <laughs> tell your server please fail. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of dumb. It's like reverse engineering. It's much easier to do with fakes and stops, mocks, 
all the synonym words we're gonna call today, because we can tell right away, please return, you know, 404. That's it. And many people assume there are, it's like myth, right? There is no errors. Like, all oh, users <laughs> got like <laughs> hybrid scenarios, why do we need to even like uh, simulate those errors? That's not true. On the scale, if we have millions of users, you don't even imagine how big percentages of users who got some failures, errors, different errors. Yeah, so we need to, uh, we, we need to make sure that we know how uh, our app behaves in case of error. That's what we want to test here, right? We would simulate the error on the backend and we will test how our app behaves. The UX should be good, the, uh, the UX should be in such a way that users uh, like that does not become angry on us, right? And so on and so forth. Angry, that's a good word. A lot of people like say, oh my God, I cannot log into the Tinder. Forcefully. There's no more date for me tonight. Delete. That's it, I'm done, right? <laughs> my, my personal life ruined. <laughs> So yeah, a lot of people get frustrated with that and we get a lot of this, but again, how backend testing is a different story. It's a backend problem, right? They have to test their own errors, but how the application give you a right error and there is a lot of different flows in application, right? Uh, authentication has at least a couple dozen of flows that actually brings you different errors. And this is very important and it's impossible to do it with the live backend services. You have to mock them. Great, let's move to the next slide. So now we're gonna talk about how the mock environment gonna look like. So think about this, all we do, we inject into our application code, right? And uh, again, with native test automation, we're, we're, everything we're gonna show today is gonna be XUI test. XUI test is nothing more than just a simple library, it's part of Xcode. When you download Xcode, it's there already. Zero installation, it's part of the Xcode. And it's part of the exit test, which is unit test framework used by all the developers. So again, everything comes out of the box. Uh, we're not gonna talk about XUI test as a framework uh, or a library or about exit test. We're all gonna say that the whole code lives in the same uh, code base as the application itself. So basically, developers and test automation engineers work on the same repository. Same, same uh, GitHub or GitLab, whatever repo, right? And that means that every time you commit anything, it goes through the same code review, same pull request process as a developer. So pretty much you're a developer, right? But the good thing about this, we can inject a very lightweight web server. It's, it's literally very lightweight. And there's uh, more than one alternative. We're gonna show you one example today, but there's more than one. And uh, what it does basically, uh, that server intercepts all the outgoing requests and instead of going to the back end, it's gonna return the responses we gonna predetermine ahead of time. But basically gonna say that, always log in on the Boris and the Boris is only one match keyboard, all the time. So we tell them, so basically your server is not gonna go anywhere outside, it actually will be inside your application. It's called mock server. Right. And it's very common in iOS and Android world. There's a OK HTTP mock web server on Android, out of the box, a very common one. Every developer knows this. And there's few exist, uh, we're gonna talk about Ambassador today, but there's a XCBTUI oh, test tunnel, that's a very long, long word. There's more than one exist on iOS, and it's up to you which one you choose. And but you can write your own. You, you can write your own, own servers. It's very light, exactly. It's basically what it does, can you click through the few? Yeah. So I'm gonna show you, Boris can actually talk more about this. So we need to preset the data, as I mentioned, and also it's important that every test should be able to preset its own data, right? One test, we want to log in with Boris and have the match eager, and the second test wants to log in with somebody else. And the third test wants to try to log in, but the server should return error, that there is no such account. So the whole idea is, every test is able to configure its own setup. Manual tests have to do uh, write, test, uh, write test cases on a regular basis called precondition, right? Exactly the same thing. In automated tests, each test will have a precondition and form says, hey, please, uh, create me a response that always will look like this before even test starts. So this way, you are preparing fake data to be returned. Full orchestration, right? Let's walk through our other ones. 
So as we talked about already, full test orchestration. Every test can configure its own setup. Uh, we are not uh, dependent on web server updates. Uh, we configure our own responses. They're fast and reliable. If we need to mock delay, uh, the, mo the majority of uh, the web servers will allow you to like specify that I want like 1.5 seconds on this particular response. Uh, we are able to test analytics. We have a separate topic today for analytics. We'll talk about that <coughs> later. And we can cover negative escapes. We can force this observer to return some error. Let's say 404, there is no such account or whatever, if we need it. Let's go to the demo. Yeah. Yay, so demo. demo. Wake up, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> the fun part. Can you change the presentation mode? Oh, yeah. Okay, like I mentioned, we're gonna show uh, code, and the good thing about good code is very well written, so it's readable, it's like plain English. You don't have to be like a super uh, IES developer, a senior level to understand this. Here we go. Okay. Can everybody see that from the last row? Awesome. Yes. Okay. Very quick recap of the app, what are we showing here? This is our application under test. We wrote it specifically for this purpose. So uh, this is Charles. Who knows what is Charles or White Shark or any other tool? Charles, Fiddler. Anybody? Raise your hand. This will become your best friend once you start. So guys, if you don't know any proxy tool, I don't know how you have a job. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah. you have to. You have to. Nowadays, you need to use some proxy to intercept network events. It just intercepts everything that comes out of client, and you can you can see all the requests and all the responses. And some uh, tools even uh, allow you to replace uh, some of them or put breakpoints. But the basic functionality is basically show me what actually is happening under the Right? The app somehow communicates with the server, with the backend. So I would like to know what exactly are the HTTP responses and HTTP uh, requests and responses. And by the way, there are multiple other protocols, right? Web sockets, uh, you name it. But uh, today we uh, will focus on the HTTP, on REST. Okay, so uh, basically the app is uh, very similar, uh, simple. Uh, it allows us to see the list of restaurants and uh, you can go to some particular restaurant, you can uh, make a reservation here, you can uh, detect the table. On the simulator you will be able to put the table number, but on the real device it will open the camera and we're looking forward uh, QR code. And then you are able to uh, do some order, right? You, you have the menu and you can order it right here. Okay. Uh, so, as you can see right now, I just run this app. So this is the real data. Uh, and I chose the login later option, but you can also log in with the Facebook if needed. So those are restaurants that are stored where? Client or server? Where does restaurants come from? Server. Server, yeah. server, obviously, right? Any client app will request the data, the actual data from the backend. The backend knows how to get it, probably from the database or probably from the third party API, it doesn't really matter today. Uh, somehow server returns these restaurants and we uh, can interact with them. Charles will show us how, to, how, how it's happening, right? So we have this uh, IP address and uh, port, so the address of server, right? And we can see that there was one HTTP request, it was a GET request to endpoint places and the response was the JSON. Who knows what is JSON? Yes. Good. Good. So basically, this JSON contains the uh, necessary data, right? This is an array of restaurants. Pretty and much then the data you see that rep replicates what yeah. you see on the, the whole screen. job of the app is to render the JSON we get from the server, right? You can see there, are, there was a like, bunch of restaurants. We can see it here. Now, our idea is what? to cut off the real backend, right? To set up the lightweight mock uh, server inside the app, and whenever app will try to send the HTTP request to our backend, this lightweight server will intercept it, 
and we will preset up it. Hey, right now I don't need 10 restaurants. Return me two restaurants. This is the name of the first, this is the name of the second. This is the address of the first, this is the address of the second. That's what is the menu inside the first restaurant. And now the test knows exactly the data that should be returned. And it knows exactly what to test. Yeah, let me give you an Does example. If you sense. look at the application right here, the board shows that we don't know which restaurant the server is going to return. It can change any time, right? Exactly. Anybody can update. Uh, that's, that, that's the problem with the test, especially in test automation. We want to expect a certain like, you know, layout, certain data, form in a certain way. Because we are testing not the backend, we're testing how the client works. We assume backend yeah. is correct and yeah. it returns correct JSON. That's our assumption. So what we're always going to show you is like how completely cut off from backend and tell exactly which restaurant uh, to return on the fly with changing all these fields if you want to. Okay, uh, I prepared one test here. Uh, this is reservation test. So basically we go to the restaurant and we open the reservation uh, menu and we provide some date and phone number and number of people and try to reserve. Uh, first thing we need to understand here, uh, if I would try to do it right now with uh, reservation, let's provide my phone and let's provide number of people. Everybody actually wrote Boris phone. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll try to book it. First of all, Apple ask us to log in. And Facebook login is something non trivial on iOS and in mobile in general, right? Facebook runs a lot of different tests and it always... Who, who tried to automate Facebook login in the native way? When you open the web view and provide email and password. Nightmare. This is a nightmare, really. It, it just doesn't work. So we want somehow to, pro like to fool our app. You are logged in already and you cannot do it with a real server. But with mock server, you can. Mock server will not, well, it will not uh, try to authenticate you. It will believe that you have the permission to ask this request. Okay, so um, let's try to run this test. <coughs> and we use this page object model. You probably know what it is. Uh, same thing for mobile. Who knows it from that? Okay, so you see only two restaurants because we told to do that. Uh, and now uh, we try to do it without number of people. Uh, okay, and we fail somehow. Um, Murphy's Law. Yeah, Murphy's Law, of course. Yeah. Every time you do a demo do. during the presentation, it always fails. You try 10 times before it works. And <laughs> That's how it is. <laughs> so I always say Murphy's Law. Isn't it amazing, right, how it is? <laughs> I know what was that. Okay, doesn't really matter. Uh, so it passed here. Um, what can we do here? Did you see how fast was that, by the way? Yeah. First of all, how many people did IPO before? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. That's my joke. Um, right, and uh, uh, right here, uh, Charles right now does not show us local post request. But uh, you, you can see that the last request to the, our actual IP address was like two minutes ago, right? 1936, and it's already 1938, so it was like two minutes ago. We did not hit the real backend when we were running this test. Does it make sense? Yes. Any questions for now? Or we have a Q&A right now, right? Yeah. Do you want to basically maybe, uh, how many people are interested to see how it's implemented quickly? Yay, a lot of people. Yeah, okay, so as Igor mentioned, there are a lot of different alternatives here. Uh, basically, you need to achieve one simple idea. You need to intercept the network and be able to replace it with your own stuff. And uh, like there, are, there is this popular tunnel stuff, which is not actually the server at all. It intercepts the URL session of iOS and replaces data there. But Ambassador is more readable. Uh, very, very common, ambassador. The, uh, it's called embassy, actually. Yeah, embassy ambassador. On the GitHub, right. you can find it. Yeah. It's Basically, the implementation is pretty simple. We have this um, router of uh, ambassador. Ambassador is open source project, by the way, so you can like download it, play around with it, fork it if you need your own functionality. 
uh, and, and they have instructions how to embed in your existing the application. Yeah. On their GitHub, step by step. It's pretty simple. Just Cocoa Pod with dependency. Yeah, and our consulting uh, actually opened a bunch of issues right there because we uh, we needed some like functionality that did, does not exist there. So uh, basically, uh, we have this stopped JSONs right here, and um, we uh, construct these JSONs on the fly. And uh, you just override the endpoints, right? You say, hey, uh, for this endpoint places, please return this response. Uh, if you need, uh, there are a bunch of configurable parameters there. You can say, return it after one second or whatever. But basically the idea is very simple. You just manually construct the JSON on the fly. And then, so you can parameterize it. You can actually tell the uh, JSON schema what actual values you want to return. That's what we say the test setup before test and precondition. You can say always return restaurant name like McDonald's, and it will inject it in JSON return. So it's very very light. So you construct your JSON response on the fly. Yeah. There is one caveat before I forgot. There is one problem with this. Only one. If the backend changes the schema, how the actual JSON format looks it will fail your client because client already using your schema. How, uh, however, if you talk to your uh, backend either automation engineer or the backend engineers or they tell you, they are anticipating to change it or you will know hard way when your test failing. Yeah. I mean, That's ideally the backend should not change like, Very the schema, often. right? Because all the, all the previous clients will, will die, basically. So, but sometimes it happens, That's true. And um, uh, there, are one, there is one trick, actually. Uh, the the real app, right? The real app that is under uh, your test doesn't know that you are intercepting or whatever. So you need somehow to specify what IP address to point your all, all your requests, right? So you need to set up whenever you run your test, you need to send a signal to your app that hey, right now this is not a user, this is a test. So point all your requests not to the whatever IP address is for your backend, but for, for example, localhost for your local web server. Uh, I think yeah. we have still one more topic, so yeah, let's do Q&A here. Let's do Q&A for this topic, for studying. Feel free to ask any question. Stupid question is always good. <laughs> what is a stop server? <laughs> anything, guys, anything. Is this ambassador from now? Proxy or Microsoft can use it for web testing as well? No, it's a, a ambassador is Swift. specifically built in Swift for the IES. But there are However, tons of, of there is a web there's a lot of web proxies built for web optimization and you can I actually for web world uh, a lot of people actually write just a separate uh, mock server and they deploy it just like a regular server, it just doesn't have database live data and point the web application to the you know fake server. So uh, I've, I've seen it as a common way. I think we have used something called Live Mock. Yeah. That was integrated with the server. Yeah. But to me, this this approach can work. The other approach is harder because then, see, if it is not tied to your test, the preset preset is out, like outside of the test. Yeah. Now you have to maintain these two things. You have to maintain all the you know your test data yeah. hierarchy somewhere else. If it changes, it's a maintenance. Uh, I agree. You have nothing new, comes for free. Nothing comes for free. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, a lot of people. Uh, what uh, again? What's the name? Praveen. Praveen. Thank you. He mentioned an amazing thing. Uh, maintenance is number one pain in testing. If you think as automation engineer you're going to write tests, you're wrong. Eighty percent of the time you will maintain them, and twenty percent are going to write new ones. That's the reality. However, when you think about this right implementation, that's why we talk about orchestration. Data is important. People are looking for the easy way out, for silver bullet. They use a proxy server, which is basically intercept live events and always record, uh, returns the recorded data, but there is no setup. So you don't control the data, you get kind of cache data, all the time, same thing. But the problem with this, you have no orchestration, which actually you pay the price for this. So with this solution, it's a little bit hard implementation in the beginning, but then you're enjoying the full orchestration. You can tell your test what to do, what to return, what kind of data you work with. So the tests be become very configurable. And like I said, on the web world, there's solutions like this exist. Uh, one, one more. That, 
Ambassador helps with the formatting all the JSON, you know. Or you wait, yeah, manual, ideally you, you store it in the file and then you read from the file. Ambassador has nothing to do with this. Ambassador just allows you to say this is endpoint, this is what I need to return. And how to store this, okay. this is your particular it's thing. And by the way, this is not ideal. Ideally you will store it to file and uh, like share the data so you can configure from every test. So there are many improvements. This is you just a demo. Yeah, yeah but uh, it's nothing to, yeah, it's up to you how you orchestrate your uh, JSON's different file. The fakes. Yeah. So you have to do all, for all this. You have to prepare all the data. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Yes. You need to first of all intercept this data with charts or whatever. You need to understand what is returned to your app. And then you need to mock every single endpoint that is somehow touched with your tests. So you're gonna know backend by heart. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is easy. Bad. Or you can take some help from backend guys. Which Very that's smart. Idea. That's the ideal. You come to this, say, hey, give me swagger, right? You're going to see all the yeah. documentation. That's the only way. That's why uh, it, there is no okay. such thing that I am manual tester, I'm automation engineer, he's a backend. It's a one team. It's a share knowledge. Guys, the, in the testing world, everybody has to be on the same you know, boat. If not, it's a failure. You have to actually know what everybody doing and help each other. That's the only way. Let's get one more question and we'll move yeah. on. I'm curious how, how many tests do you run just by number? Like each test has, <coughs> I'm assuming each test has its own JSON, or each scenario has its own JSON in your case? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, so uh, do you have hierarchy in JSON files also, like one file can be shared? Yes. Obviously so there's, there's, a lot of share, yeah, there's a lot of shared data, absolutely, um, uh, because just like, in, I mean, the same response can be reused across multiple tests. But uh, in terms of Tinder, we have about 200 functional tests. And the reason we don't grow them, we only cover P1 test cases, which is kind of the most important one. The rest we try to do differently. We have manual testers, for, the, for instance, right? But uh, the, the, the most important thing about this approach, it allows you to put your test in CI. So they run every merge. So speed, right? That's the most important thing, scalability. And, and we don't cover speed today, by the way. Yeah, yeah, completely yeah, separate topic. Yeah, we have separate, separate set of tools to achieve the speed. We yeah. talk about the scalability here. How but it move. contributes to speed. And the most important thing, your stability. Our failure rate is less than 1% on functional tests. It's remarkable. And we are in the same boat as LinkedIn. Although LinkedIn has like thousands of engineers, but we are less than 1% because of this. And, sorry, dude. One, one more follow-up question for this one is, I don't know how many apps do you have, but each app will have just one functional thread, or you only have one? Per repository, each repo. So each repo, okay. Yeah, yeah. it's thing. isolated, it's hermetic. It's like, it leaves, just think about them as a unit test. Unit tests also get mocked. He writes unit tests every day, they also get mocked. In a different way, because in unit tests, you only test the code. Here you test the more like integration part, right? But each repo, in our case, IES it has uh, one repository for IES app for Tinder. It has all the map data. Android has completely different solution and separate repo. Mm -hmm. All right, Thank you. one last question. Um, I was just wondering, what is the application like? You know, do you want to? Do you guys use a Tinder test uh, via mock service and deploy it, or do you just test the build quality and do the more uh, deep down test, functional test, involving the data there. Because you know, once it goes into the real world, that thing that you have taken out is going to come, and those stored procedures or you know, data so synchronization is coming. Manager? Coming. Sorry? Are you manager? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just I'm asking because you're asking a very good question. Yeah, from uh, uh, what Prashant is actually asking is, in terms of this is not. Uh, going to be a solution that's going to replace manual testing or the end-to-end -end testing. We have to understand this. This is the, what we call gatekeeper. Think about this. Every developer makes pull requests, one per day at least. There's multiple, like at least 20, 30 pull requests get merged daily at least on a busy application. Think about how many times we can fail. This is the first guard. We have multiple gates, right? But this is the first entry gate of the unit test, uh, Swift lint, right? Cold static analysis, and this. After that, obviously, there should be backend uh, API tests that covers all functionality from API layer because we don't test live services. This 
and 100% manual testing. Manual testing is not gonna go anywhere, you have to do this. But this one can catch, it slap the hand like, hey man, you broke something. 99% this test actually don't break because of the bug, they break because of the change of UI, which is okay. That's the way it's supposed to do. But they catch really good bugs. I mean, you have a story, he has a story that after this presentation, Boris can tell you one-on-one, -on -one, like what kind of bugs this test catch that's impossible to catch manually. All right, thank you very much, Igor Boris. Do we need to disconnect this? Yes. Thank you. Thank you.